I'm going to be speaking about the US 84 Mississippi River Bridge uh, pen and link replacement. The project's located in Natchez, Mississippi. For those that don't know the geographic location, uh, we've got the Mississippi River, which divides Mississippi and Louisiana. And the project's right over there where that big star is. Uh, just to kind of geography, the next crossing besides Natchez, you've got to go up to Vicksburg, and the one south of that is Baton Rouge. So the project we'll be talking about is a truss bridge in uh, Natchez, Mississippi. The, uh, the bridge is a uh, five-span cantilever truss bridge. It was built back in 1940, part of the uh, public works uh, program, designed by h and and built by Bethlehem and uh, Dravo Corporation. Uh, it was built for $3.5 million. So I wish we could build a bridge for that nowadays. Location, what we've got, the bridge is a cantilever truss. It has a suspended span and some quasi-suspended spans. This is something that's a little unique to the, uh, to the structure, something that I think the original designer was uh, trying to play with back in the 40s. The suspended span is very traditional where we've got a, a, a suspended span right in the middle and then these are the quasi-suspended spans. And these suspended spans and the quasi-suspended spans are held up by a pen and link, which is traditional like most uh, cantilever truss bridges. What's, un what's unique about this truss is the fact that instead of a full length member for your hanger, it's a link that's contained in just the upper gusset, in the upper location. It is about a, t you've got a 10 inch diameter pin on the top and bottom, and then about a 10 inch by 16 inch by seven foot six inch forged link, just big uh, massive dog bone. The, Here's a, here's a photo of, you can see this is the lower pin on the upper side and then here's the upper pin as well as this is the dog bone after we removed it. So in 1995, Mississippi Department of Transportation observed that the U-29 downstream up our lower pin had shifted. They, they had not observed this before and it was during a routine inspection. Uh, they noticed that the keeper plates that hold the pin on and keep it from moving were sheared off and as well as the pin had rotated. The pin is, has some welds oops, on, the, on the top and you could see that the weld was broken and that weld was intended to keep the pin from rotating and having the pin stay static while everything rotated around the, uh, the link. MDOT advertised a contract. They got a little nervous. They realized that the pin was flush with the outside gusset and any additional movement uh, inside could potentially cause uh, the bridge to lose its factor of safety. Uh, they, they did not like the thoughts of losing one of these pins because it is a fracture critical member. So they did advertise a project to reset the pins and that was not successful back in 1995. In fact, the contractor tried to take the load off of it, attempted four times to reset it, and he was unsuccessful. He just could not get that pin to move at all. Uh, ultimately, MDOT decided, you know, it seems to be in a stable condition, let's just monitor it. So from that point forward, they have been monitoring it. In 2010, we H and T B was was assisting with an inspection, and we observed that U twenty nine was staying static, but U forty nine, another location, had become flush with the gussets. So that was a little alarm for the state because now you've got just not one location but two locations, and we don't have a really good understanding of why do why is this pin shifting. Here's the uh, here's some images of the of the pins. So this is U29 downstream. You can see here it's pretty much flush with the gusset. In 95 it was zero, it rotated. And for the most part, 2010, 2012, it, it stayed constant. You can see on the opposite side, the, uh, the pen was sticking out by about an inch. And we were observing bulging on the outside gussets. So maybe the pen was trying to pull its way out, pull the gussets with it. We, uh, maybe there's pack rust behind the gussets. We just did not like that situation of the unknown. 
Uh, U49, similar. In fact, you can see the weld here far better uh, where it had broken, the, the keeper plate had sheared off. So something happened where it locked up and then it, it, it allowed it to shear off. U49 upstream truss was flush. And then on the back side as well, it was protruding out by, you know, an inch for the most part. H and TB sat down with MDOT and really thought through what can we do, what do we, what should we do, and we we worked through an all, a, array of four main options. The first option was restraint and monitor. It's a great option. You know, this is about you know the lowest cost. Do what you've been doing. Just keep on monitoring it. Uh, what the state didn't like about this option was that they had no indication of what was causing U49 to move and what might cause an additional pin to move. Uh, they do have problems on other river bridges where when the river gets high, it does certain things, it shifts, it moves, and they can go out there and monitor it. This case, they really had nothing to do outside of every two years as part of your routine inspection. Uh, the second one was re reset the pins. Just pick up the plans that you prepared back in 1995 and try to push that pin back into place. Uh, they did not like this option either because you know you, you're just going to potentially have a repeat of history. Uh, they would pay a contractor to get out there, try to reset the pin. He can't do it, and then they let him out the contract, and they're back at square one. Uh, the third option was just replace the pin. We we looked at the links, looked at the upper pin, and they looked in decent condition. So why spend the money to replace the upper pins but just the lower pin? Uh, ultimately, the state went with option four, which was replace the pin and link, uh, upper and lower pins, and replace, it, replace the whole assembly. And I think that was the key thing, that they realized that this system, or these pins and links, is a system. They act together, and you can't really replace one without replacing the other. Uh, it, it was both decided by Louisiana and Mississippi Department of Transportation because it is a shared border crossing. Uh, they did do a risk analysis. We went through uh, a lot of steps just to get to that decision. So going into the design, I mean, the first thing to do is how do I remove and replace a pin on a structural member that's holding up the entire bridge or holding up portions of the bridge? And you look down and you think through the, uh, how the bridge is built and how the bridge is uh, functioning and follow the load path. So you've got your suspended span over here on your right. This is a tension member that's just hanging on by this pin and link. Uh, where the, you've got your cantilever suspend, which is in compression. And then at the bottom, you have a false cord. These are zero force members just holding up the deck. The first step in creating a bypass is to create a legitimate bypass that truly locks the joint and allows the, allows the whole joint to stay contained. I think our biggest fear was the spring effect. We've got everything in, and then all of a sudden you take the pen link out, and you've got the spring, things shift, things move, and then you can't get things to line back up. You've got, you're hanging this bridge off by a couple, some threads, or even uh, the contractor bumps into one of your, your temporary restraints and damages it. Then what do you, do you have the potential of losing your bridge? So we were very mindful of being, uh, having some redundancy, one of the things we did, or the first thing we did is we created a diagonal bypass. So this is, again, this is following the load path. Just where is your load? Your load is down here at the suspended span. We picked it up from the bottom, and then we uh, grabbed it from the top and, and kind of hung, uh, hung the bridge from the cantilever span. Load path B. So in the event this contractor has got some PT bars, these are about four uh, one and three quarter inch diameter bars. If he bumps into one, knocks it, or we lose one of those, we were going to have a secondary load path. And our secondary load path was to take the false cord on the bottom and make it a member that's part of the bridge. And also tie the, the truss in up at the, uh, top. This way it would be prevented from moving laterally, or I'm sorry, longitudinally. This was a very important step because we had a moving target. That expansion joint or that pin and link was allowed to move back and forth. That's where the entire bridge for that section was allowed to open and close. So we would we applied a long, upper longitudinal restraint, which is just a compression force, put some shims in at the top, 
and then pushed it, you know, locked it down and did the same thing for the bottom. Fortunate thing, the false cord, even though it's really a zero force member, they used it for erection. It was sized as if it were a normal truss member. So we had the capacity to use it if we needed to. The third uh, bypass is a splice plate. This is the key to the whole operation. This was what locked everything down uh, finally. And you've got your diagonal bypasses, which will take 95% of your load. You tension those, you get all your load off uh, the suspended span, off, I'm sorry, off that pin and link, but then you put the splice plate on and you lock it all down and it, it is now fixed from moving in, in the uh, longitudinal direction. We designed the splice plate so that it can, be, it can handle 100% of the load. So in the event that you lose path A, which is the diagonal bypath, by, bypass, or path B, you still have that path C. So the project was advertised in 2014. MDOT decided that the magnitude of the work warranted not just any general contractor walking out there. And they, they understand low bid and the feds require that, but we don't need Joe McGee's trucking service bidding on this and saying, hey, I, I've fixed an axle before, I can do this. So we, we went through, advertised an RFQ to shortlist contractors. Those contractors were then shortlisted, and then they were provided a set of plans that h and prepared, and they bid on those. The, short, uh, the, the low bid came in from a regional contractor out of Lafayette, Louisiana, CEC. He's a really good contractor that does a lot of movable bridge work and specialty type of work. Uh, the, the other thing to note, the bridge was closed to traffic for 11 weeks. This is something that when they previously tried to reset the pins, they did not close the bridge to traffic. They, kept it, they closed one lane. You, the bridge is very narrow. You see that vibration. You see those forces from the other lane still affecting your, your uh, I guess, your pin and link on your truss. Plus, we, we understood the magnitude. We're kind of doing uh, knee surgery on this bridge. And if something should go wrong, we didn't want the public on it. So what I'm going to go over now is a step-by-step -step procedure that we went through in order to replace the pen. Uh, it was a very well thought out procedure. It was something that h and put a lot of time and thought into. And then the contractor ultimately uh, adopted. He came in with some of his own ideas that were, I thought, pretty good, you know, means and methods on how he would do some of the details. But for the most part, he did follow the general plan, uh, procedure that was adopted in the plans. And I think this is something that was very different. Normally, as an engineer, we do not get into means and methods. But because of this project being so unique and so high risk, we felt we had to lay out a procedure that we were very confident would work for the contractor. So the first thing to do is you tension the diagonal bypasses. You, you come up, you grab it from the top, and you're ten, you've got your, uh, your, your lower restraints down below. We did put instrumentation on the bridge so that we could evaluate the behavior of the truss. So if we saw any members changing in forces that we weren't expecting, it could mean that we've had a failure in one of our restraints. Uh, we did see a lot of predictable behavior, which is very re reassuring, where, for example, the tension, we tensioned the diagonal bypass to 836 kips. So we would see a change in load of about 850 kips in the diagonal member, in that truss member, and the dead load in that member is 761 kips. So when we tensioned it, we were seeing a change in the load in the members that we wanted to see change. And even the link, that's really what we're trying to go after. We're trying to take all that load off that link. We, its dead load is around 660 kips. We saw 655 kips change in force. After tensioning the diagonal bypass, we had to tension the upper longitudinal restraints. We got to lock this bridge down from wanting to expand and contract anymore. So we did that, we applied uh, tension load. That was based off the temperature. If we predicted a change in temperature of 40 degrees, then we would uh, apply a certain force. Uh, we did tension both trusses, even though we're only working on one of them. We just, we didn't want to have this uh, kind of prying action where one is allowed, one truss is allowed to open and close while the other one's locked down. The next, side, the next step was to weld the templates for the splice plate. So installing this big mass of one inch splice plate over the existing two gussets. And you've got 
300 A490 bolts that you've installed into the actual existing gusset that are protruding out and the contractor had fill plates and so on and then he had to take these templates, put them on and then weld them together and the next step was to fly them down and he had this one inch splice plate on the ground where he just used his template to drill his holes into the splice plate and beat to fit. That's the uh, time modern method, you know, good old hammer, knock it in. So he was, a, he was very successful on it. it. It was a challenge, but ultimately, you know, it was not uh, unachievable. The next item was to install a top strut plate. This is again more about that, that, uh, that spring concern. So we knew that there should be no lateral loads outside of wind, we could design for that, but what would we have, do we have any locked up forces in, the, in this truss member in the lateral direction? And you, what you have over here is a plate that was installed on the top where it connected the two uh, struts together and provided a more rigid connection for the, uh, the lateral connection. Step six was to install the lower longitudinal restraints. This purpose was to act as a secondary bypass. So this is on the bottom core, it's pretty simple. Compress, you know, you got your post tensioning, put some shim blocks in, post tension it, and uh, put on a splice plate. This is where the contractor kind of got a little innovative. Our, our plans just said, contractor, cut the pin. And he came through and he decided to use a wire saw. He was able to take the wire saw, wrap it down into the link and grab it on the, I guess the face between the, the link and the gusset and then spin it and start cutting upwards. That way he was breaking the, the actual pin from the face of the gusset. The pin would still be stuck inside the link but then that face was broken. Uh, it took him about uh, one and a half hours per face of pin. Uh, like any good project, it's usually hurry up and wait, but once he got going, uh, it really was a smooth operation. The, uh, the one thing we did notice when the pins were cut, we did see a transfer of force. So even though we had our diagonal bypasses, we thought we overstressed it or we got it to that exact point where we believe the load is, it's still, you would still see a shift in force. So we saw about a 20 to 40 kips delta in the link when those pins were cut and it was completely released. We, would, we also saw about a one to three KSI jump in the splice plate. We had put some gauges on the splice plate. Uh, that was really attributed to the fact now that load is going somewhere and it's gonna stiffness uh, tracks force. That splice plate is far more stiff than the uh, diagonal restraints and it all went into that splice plate. These are some images of the pins after they were cut and dropped. So one thing you can see over here is how much grooving the pin had. The, uh, there was a lot of uh, really deep grooving which really, you know, kind of when we reflected on it, allowed us to realize this contractor, even the previous contractor, never had a chance of trying to push the pins back into place. The, these things become one with their material or with the uh, gussets. Uh, we saw that the pin was probably the weaker of the two metals where it is, the pin had more conforming, it, it had more uh, grooving than the actual gussets. Uh, and plus the original designers were never intended the pin to rotate. So with that, uh, there was a higher bearing stress on the pins and that was starting to wear and groove the pins down. And, and this was also seen even on the gussets too, it was wearing the gussets where we would have an oblonged hole. Uh, next item is to remove the link. So we, we uh, were mindful of where we put our diagonal restraint so that we could lift the actual link from above, put a, well the pad eye on top and then just uh, lift it out. Not, uh, next step was to install a new eye bars. Instead of the link, we're gonna go back with the traditional two inch thick plates, multiple of them, give us some type of internal redundancy. One thing that the contractor decided to do was instead of trying to bore these eye bars and line everything up, he said, let me get a hole that's undersized in the actual links, or I'm sorry, the eye bars, and then I'm gonna bore everything together. And I'm gonna lock, I'm gonna temporarily lock the eye bars down to the truss, 
get them all in place. And that's kind of what he's doing here. He's got a template that he's setting up so he can drill holes there so that he may lock the eye bars to the truss. Next thing to do is once he's got it all locked in, he comes in with a line boring machine and line bores a brand new hole through both the upper and lower pins. That way he's made sure that they're both plumb, they're both in line, everything is proper. We, we worked with him on oversizing our link so he had some factor safety. He could take off a little on the top, a little on the bottom or the sides. Uh, it, it, it was a very slow operation to line bore. It took them about a day 24 hours working around the clock to actually uh, measure everything. And then from once they measured and they felt comfortable and they had all the numbers uh, correct, then it took about 30 hours for them just to line bore through the whole system. And they're going from about a 10 inch hole to about a 10 and three quarter inch hole. The next item was to install the new pin. This was uh, pretty straightforward. In fact, when he pushed it in, it slid out the other side and he had to run around the other side and push it back because he put it on ice, he did everything right, and he had a brand new clean hole that was just nice, smooth, greased, and it, it went in without any, uh, with no problems. Uh, then we installed the new restrainer plate. Instead of the old restrainer plate, which was a keeper plate that had a through bolt that went through it, we went back with something a little more robust. I've seen this on other truss bridges as well as on movable bridges where you square your ends and you put a, a restrainer plate that kind of locks it in. It does not allow that pin to rotate and it really prevents it from wanting to shift. Uh, lessons learned. When we went through this, uh, when we talked about the project up front, we did our research and there are not many examples of people replacing truss bridges. You're gonna find more railroads that have done this. Most of us in the highway system will build a new bridge. It becomes functionally obsolete where we are faced in our industry, especially in the South, we don't have the budget to build a new Mississippi River Bridge and just replace it. So the state says we need to, uh, we need to actually extend the life of the bridge by another 75 years. Uh, we did uh, find, do go through some lessons learned on this project. Uh, existing pin misalignment. This is something that kind of caught us off guard because you could not measure this until you actually remove the pins. And we believe this is probably one of the reasons why the lower pins was starting to move. The, if you can see in the bottom right photo or image, the upper pin is at an angle where the lower pin is plumb. So with that, when you rotate back and forth, it's allowing that lower pin to work its way out. Uh, the existing pin was off by 3 16 per foot. Uh, inboard, it was the high side. Existing lower pin was uh, plumb. Most likely, uh, the, the lower pin, if it's walking back and forth, moving, it, it's wearing on that gusset and it's going to find its equilibrium. Uh, planned, uh, the plan was to use a 10 and quarter new pin. We quickly realized that that was not enough. Because we wanted the new pins to be plumb to the world, and that the old pin, the old hole was at an angle, we had to go with the larger size diameter pin. Unfortunately, that contractor already had his pins on the site for, uh, for those the 10 and a quarter. He had another 10 and three quarters in the, in, the, uh, in the shop. We were able to use that 10 and three quarter pin for the upper pin. Uh, U29, and I think the lesson learned we realized from here is we, not, we measured, we removed the pins on the next location we waited till we got all of our measurements, then we called the fab shop. They were a 24-7 operation. They started, they turned down the pin to the dimensions we, we specified or we required, and they had everything out to us the next morning. So that, whereas before that contractor in the first location, he wanted everything on site. I want to see it with my own eyes. Uh, this time we realized, you know, the next go around, we, we can't have it on our site. We just need to see it in the shop. Uh, U29 truss shift. This is another one that kind of threw us off. And it, all these bridges are unique and have their own nuances and quirks. And this is one of the quirks part of this bridge where the upper and lower pin where they kind of come together, one of the gussets was shifted. And it's kind of hard to see, but in this member, this is your cantilever, suspan, or cantilever span. So this is a compression member and it's actually buckled out. It is shifted out about, uh, I think it was like two inches, and it allowed, you know, you can see this, should, this section over here should be almost flush with this section over there. 
And we had, there were a bunch of angles and plates in the way. Uh, once those were removed, it quickly came obvious that something's wrong, something's not aligning. Uh, what we speculate happened is when the bridge was built back in the 40s, they, oops, they did something a little different than what you normally do, where they suspended out the entire suspended span and then made their tie, their location where they pinned everything together at U29. So at the location where we have the shift is where they made that final uh, tie-in point. What we speculate happened is, you know, you're back in the 40s, it's off by inch and a quarter, and that's what come-alongs are for. So they yanked it over, pulled it all in, stuck the pins, stuck the links in, and let go, and everything equalized and said, looks good. And that's, again, why we put in a strut plate at the top, because we didn't know about these unforeseen forces. Uh, the other thing is the existing pins and gussets. Existing pins was were not plumb. Uh, existing lower pin was close to plumb. Uh, gussets were not plumb. This is on the, uh, the U29. Uh, cantilever truss, because it was shifted, we had to go back to the drawing board. We ended up adding additional bolts. So we really had about 200 A490 bolts, and then we decided to go up to about around 300. Uh, which that was uh, due to the fact that we have uh, the bolts have an eccentricity, they have a, a cantilever arm associated with them because you're shifted out. Uh, we ended up installing additional splice plates, uh, a bracing plate in the middle, as well as a bracing plate up top to help uh, lock everything in. A couple of things, you know, one of the, one of the things I wanted to share with y'all is the strain gauge readings. We, we did see about 5 KS, 5 to 7 KSI stress on the U29. So previously I said about 1 to 3 KSI. That was on the first one. But now as we got to the second one, uh, U29, the shift, we were seeing a lot of different things go on. And we believe it's because of that shift. Where one side of the plate was about 7 KSI, but the inboard was different. It was far less. The other thing, uh, what we did is we had an instrumentation on the new links. And you can see here, and this is kind of what I've been saying, where you had zero load at the bottom, but then once you remove the splice plate, you see this big jump in load. Where even though the diagonal bypass is still installed, you're getting uh, an increase in load. And then it equalizes out, and then we detension the diagonal bypass and it drops down and then it kind of comes over. And that sine wave is very typical of what we were seeing throughout the project. As the day heat, heats up, the, uh, you know, the, the forces would go up and then vice versa. Looking at the loads from the actual eye bars, we were seeing about a two to about 2%, two to 3% difference from what we were evaluating, we were seeing from our instrumentation to what we were, uh, what the plan said, the plan's dead load, which is really good. That's, that made us feel really good about the whole scenario. Uh, maybe, you know, 2%, that's, that's good enough for uh, 1940. What was surprising is on U29. Uh, you, and I'll back up a little. U49, we did see about a 17% greater force on the outboard bar, the eye bar, than we did the inboard eye bar. Where, you know, we did see a typical... Uh, curve down where it in the middle bars would have a decrease but we saw a higher and that could be just associated with the inboard uh in inboard is uh, a little more uh the other thing is on now i think what really threw us off was on u29 where we saw about a 44 percent greater difference and we believe this is because of the truss shift and we actually recognize that one of these gussets is probably way is loaded more than the other gusset as the truss wants to shift over, it, uh, it overloads one of the gussets. With that, uh, the MDOT was pleased with the project. They do want to, uh, or they do plan on advertising a next phase of the project where they would like to replace the remaining six pins and links. They will combine that with a painting project. Uh, traffic actually worked very well when we closed the bridge down for that 11 weeks. Uh, they now plan on closing the bridge for nine months to paint the bridge, and they said we probably, it's best, or it's in our best interest just to replace the remaining pins and links on the project. So that is something that MDOT will advertise, uh, similar to before, where they just didn't allow low bid, they went through an RFQ process, they will do that same thing. 
Uh, they will also shortlist uh, qualified painters because they understand a painter and a structural contractor have to work together and they don't want the, uh, the finger pointing, especially if the bridge is gonna end up in the water. With that, uh, again, the PDH number is 41777. Uh, if y'all have any questions, I'll be glad to answer them. We have time for one short question. Yes. Say that again. Were there any grease points, lubrication points, or bushes in the original detail? And if not, did you consider putting them in the new detail? Short answer is there were not grease points in the original pen. We did consider it on the new one, but we could not because we couldn't get the bearing stresses to work. So we ultimately decided to go back with a traditional pen. Uh, we had the contractor grease it up uh, fairly well before he installed it. but. Uh, the, I think the, the bearing stresses were not uh, were working in our favor. Thank you. Okay. Let's uh, show our appreciation for James. Thank you. Thank you. All right, um, I'm going to move right along here. Our next speaker is Bob Cisneros. He's with High Steel Structures, and he's been there since 1996, uh, serving as the chief engineer with them since 2004. Bob's a member of a number of organizations including the Associated Pennsylvania Constructors of Bridge Committee, the Ashto NSBA Steel Bridge Collaboration, and he also participates in various other industry efforts to enhance constructability and promote safe bridge fabrication and erection practices. Today, Bob's gonna to be talking to us uh, about using fabrication and metrology advances with skewed and curved pre-erected multi-span pedestrian bridges. Bob. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, while I'm loading this, I kind of rem I really enjoyed the last presentation, um, and it reminded me of my first job being assigned to uh, was before I worked at High, and we were doing a gusset plate rehab near New York City on the uh, New York State Thruway, and I remember our boss. Uh, the, the drawings have been detailed by American Bridge in the 50s, and some of you who will remember the quality of detailing that existed back then. And I was how, thinking, how are we gonna match these hole patterns? He goes, if they detailed it, he actually knew the person who deta detailed it. He goes, you could trust those holes are gonna be right. And it was right, <laughs> it was really cool. But putting those back in and using rivet busters and all that were just, uh, it brings back some memories of a very good presentation. So uh, I will try to be done in time because everybody's probably getting hungry and they were good enough to put me as a second. So I don't wanna leave any le less time for the third. So I have to be done by 5.30, it's already 5.04. Thank you for attending. Um, it's a privilege to be here. I'm here to speak to you about uh, metrology, which we'll get into, and about the assembly, uh, the trial assembly of this bridge. It was assembled twice, once at our facility in Lancaster, Pennsylvania, and the second time in Amsterdam, New York. It's a beautiful bridge. Um, once in a while, a bridge comes along that is just a pleasure to work on. It, you all have enjoyed projects and other projects you probably haven't enjoyed. I really enjoyed this job. Uh, it was a skewed, curved, haunched, high profile, high curved pedestrian bridge that has a park on it, but it was designed kind of like a highway bridge because they had to have emergency vehicles go over it. So the ironwork is both at our Lancaster facility and at Amsterdam they'd always take a step back and we didn't believe it would go from one end to the other because it just defies the usual geometry. So with that um, said, I just wanted to show you some of the details and it'll be fun. I wrote a paper, we all wrote papers, so if you want any details that I skip over or gloss over, um, you can read it in the paper because I get rather lengthy there. Um, a little bit of history. This is over the Erie Canal. Who knows the engineer who was the chief engineer for the Erie Canal? Anybody know the name? Benjamin Wright, okay? And just about any engineer in the United States in the 1800s would basically be able to train their training and lineage in the professional world, either to Benjamin Wright directly or to one of the engineers that worked for him on the Erie Canal. So there's a lot of historical significance to this canal. I had the privilege of working on a number of bridges in the past um, on the Erie Canal. And so it, just, it was kind of a culmination of the career. 
Um, this is what we're going to cover today, and I'll do this fairly quickly. Uh, we're going to talk about the bridge. I'm going to linger on history a little bit. Talk about what metrology is and some of the tools that we use to fabricate bridges nowadays. And just get into steel dead load camber verification. I do want to say something. I really enjoyed this project. Um, but high steel, as a member of the NSBA would say, and I know that we all, as all the fabricators would say, we do not recommend assembling a bridge in its entirety all the time. Very seldom do we assemble a bridge fully. It's called unit assembly. Rarely do we actually trial load a bridge. We trial loaded this bridge by removing the false work at, at our plant, and then it was re-erected in the field. It made near laboratory conditions for me. And having just gotten out of a project with the feds on um, the NCHRP project about um, whoops, curved and skewed bridges, we got to test out some of the uh, information that's in project report uh, 725, the NCHRP project. But generally speaking, if you want to read in the paper when we think full assembly is required versus regular assembly, given all today's tools and the abilities to use them, you can read out a couple pages and we'll explain based on the complexity of the bridge. I'll gloss over that for now. Um, here is what Syracuse, New York would have looked like in the 1800s. I lived a portion of my life in Syracuse, raised my kids there, worked on a number of bridges for the New York State Thruway and DOT. This is where Region 3 DOT headquarters, right where that hamburger is, which is the dinosaur. Oh, anybody ever been to the dinosaur? Oh my gosh, you're probably all getting hungry, but they have a, the dinosaurs right around there. This is now, I think, Genesee Street and Erie Boulevard's there, and this is Salina Street. That was the Erie Canal. The Erie Canal Museum is still there, and the only working toll booth, basically a toll house, is the museum now. It's very interesting for anybody, any civil engineers who have an interest in history. Um, General Washington, once the United States was established, felt it was very important that we have a canal system because just like Eisenhower was a champion of the interstate system, this was the first interstate. It was across the state. The canals were a way to get material and troops back and forth if they really needed to, and it sponsored a lot of the furthering of industry. Um, Benjamin Wright, here's the chief engineer for the canal. And here's an early bridge, and this is interesting. I just want to linger on this. I was reading about this at the museum. It's just so worth going to. Nowadays, we have the MUTCD, right, for traffic control. Back then, the, canal, you, the bridges were only about seven foot of freeboard. So if you were riding on the roof of the canal boats, they would scream out, low bridge, and it was up to you to duck when you were passing on. And, and they had uh, mules and horses along the towpath carrying the... Carrying the the canal boats. And this is a, a way lock. If you bring your children to the canal museum, they have an on, it's like semi online, semi touchy feely. You can actually see how they would weigh Archimedes principle, remember that? The, um, the toll, I'll give you a toll based on the, the weight of your payload as they were draining the uh, canal lock. It's just so interesting. But we're here to talk about bridges. Um, continue. Oh, there's one other thing. I'm actually going to use the word concrete at the World Steel Bridge Symposium. I can do that because one of our sister companies, High Concrete, we work on concrete too. But this gentleman was one of the engineers, a young engineer, uh, Canvas White, on the canal. And he developed the hydraulic cement, which if you go to some of the ruined blocks in the non-operational section today. Oh, yes, yes, yes. I'm so sorry. I will move to the microphone and stay there. Um, so if you go to some of the ruined sections of the lock, you'll still see some of that hydraulic cement. They've since replaced it on the active canal. Here are some of the metrology tools from then and now. So we're going to start transitioning. Back then you can recognize the old uh, style. This is the vertical control, right? And nowadays we use the total station. Here are some fine fellows working on caulking operations for some of the canal boats. And that's just, that was a state of the art. They have some actually original tools in the museum that you can see. Um, we'll start transitioning to metrology. This total station is so smart that my design engineer and I can both understand it as well as our Drexel University week. And it can almost run itself except when the praying mantis showed up the other day and was running it for us. And it still gave us as good numbers as when I was running it. So, so let's talk about the bridge. 
This is the, whoops, I can't move away from the podium because I don't want to put this on. This is the Mohawk Valley Gateway Overlook in Amsterdam, New York. It connects the north half to the south half of the city, which was divided by the river, which is part of the canal system. And this is what the bridge looked like when we completed in the assembly in our yard in Lancaster, Pennsylvania during the wintertime. This is what it looked like in the spring about a month later when they were putting the drop-in section in span two. It was erected, in short, from this abutment, which is the begin abutment, that's how they talk in New York, it's begin and end abutment, Begin abutment, Pier 1, Pier 2, and that had some overlooks or belvedere's here. And then this is the begin abutment right here, and that's the end abutment. Okay? And that's what it looked like. We used a lot of advanced tools. This is why I don't think we need to unit assemble everything. When we reamed, which is a fairly hazardous operation, um, reaming is like using a two foot long drill that's a one inch diameter, well, 15 16th diameter bit or a one and one sixteenth diameter bit. Has anybody used a, a half inch drill that bound up in a hole at home? What happens? Turns it around. Can you imagine doing that with a one inch drill bit that's two foot long? It'll spin you off the bridge. It'll, it'll, you know, it'll hurt, if not kill you. So it's very hazardous. So now we drill a lot of full size holes. We, the fabricators, do not want to have to build this bridge twice for free. So it behooves us to hold a tighter fabrication tolerance whenever we use full-size holes. You can read about how this bridge was assembled in the paper, but basically we used a gantry and we actually used sub-size holes because we want, had to try and load it, but we wanted to try out some new equipment. So here's, a, here's one of our gantries running and it can actually drill full-size holes or sub-size holes. The camber is generated from our CAD CAM group from the drawings. All of you who are into BIM, right? You transfer that single source data model that goes upstream to design someday and downstream to fabrication and erection. All that same data, the cambers don't change and they have to be re-input and re-input and re-input. We're at the point now where we could actually have just assembled this and hoped that it would fit and it probably would given the tolerances that we held. Now, if you read in the paper, there were a couple errors that we made that I'm glad we caught because there's a portion of the structure that you'll see that we would have assembled irregardless of whether we needed to assemble the entire structure. Let's talk about metrology. This bridge, I think there's a Dr. Seuss's landing in Disney now. Is that correct? Anybody got taking your kids in? Nobody's, okay. I want to go, but I love Dr. Seuss. And we started calling this bridge the Dr. Seuss Bridge because it was just so curvy and swervy and I'm standing there when they're erecting it in the field and the erectors tell me, are you sure you assembled this in your yard? Because we don't think it's going to land. We think that it's going to miss each other by about five feet because the curves were just a little different than the usual geometry control. This is what metrology is. It's basically shop hyper accurate survey. What's your survey tolerance in the field? With a transit level or total station? I could be asking you these questions and not give you the PDH code at the end of them. What's the survey tolerance? For shots, elevations and bearings, nearest what? Hundredth of a foot, which is about an eighth of an inch, right? Okay, okay, good. I'm talking, to, uh, I'm, so I guess I'll just continue then. Um, when you're in the shop, this thing can actually get you three millimeters, probably at about three to six hundred feet away. It's incredibly accurate. But you need to know what you're measuring. It's probably going to give you an accurate measurement on something that's so far away that I can barely physically see the feature I'm measuring. This is what the targets typically look like, taking a photo through the scope. This is a 360 prism. This is a, uh, it's like a beautiful prism. It's like a silver ball with a triangular prism with a gold inlay. And you know you're on target because that laser just shines right back at you like a lighthouse when you, uh, and then you know. As long as you've assigned your geometry correctly, you can actually detect in the previous slide, this is part of a cable stay bridge. This is the anchorage for a cable stay. It's called the Ohio River Bridge in Kentucky. And we had to make sure that these alignments, which were made by laser and shot um, when the girder was built, we had to make sure that the tolerance was hit. So what we do is we were using metrology and when we flip the girder over in the shop, we measured the near side of the girder and we flip it over. If you can see this rectangle, that's the girder web. If you looked really closely, which I'm not going to zoom in, you could actually pick up 
that deflection of the anchorage when the girder's on one side versus the other side, it's that accurate. Even though that's a stiff component, we could pick up and we had to account for that when we were doing our survey data. This is uh, what it looks like in the field. We were training our Drexel uh, students who are incredibly brilliant. If anybody needs, a, needs some uh, young engineers, I've had four Drexel University interns. I went to Cornell, by the way, so I have no vested interest in Drexel, but they're really, really smart. So anyway. Here is the way we had built the bridge back at the yard, and it is 517, so I think we're okay. Um, what we did is I did a stiffness-based 3D model, or actually my Drexel University college student did, and what we did is we, I checked it. You always, when you're using 3D programs, what's the, what's the concept? You use one program to design, and what's the other one that they say? To validate, right? So we used one program to validate the other. Well, in this case, he did the program using a stiffness model, and I just did a hand calc, and I used the V-load method. It was close enough. And what we did is we developed reactions. We used some crane mats as false work because we couldn't build piers and abutments in our yard, right? You don't want to pay your fabricator to build and demolish piers and abutments um, in your, their yard. And we just came up with controlling reactions, which were about 120 kips at the outboard of the big pier. It was about a 250-foot span. These are 130-foot side spans. Moderate size uh, bridge. Again, the ratio, it had a really long um, main span. And anyway, here are the false work layouts. And this is where we used metrology. It was really cool. Rather than have to do the angle, bearing, and offset, bearing, and offset distance, what we did is I basically drew the model in a horizontal control in MicroStation or AutoCAD. And what we then did is we exported a file, which we then imported into the total station. And then we're walking around with a 360 prism and it's like GPS mode. I'm basically telling the guy in a walkie-talkie, walk 10 feet forward, slow down, three more inches, stop. And we planted the horizontal, horizontal control points, which were basically at each end of every foundation, every substructure, two piers, two abutments. And then I just used the level to shoot the bearing points in those two lines, like you see building guys do all the time. And then there it was. I had my horizontal control for an entire bridge. Now, recognize this is in our yard. If it was in a field, I'd have to cross the river, either in a boat or go across the neighboring bridge. Then, of course, here's the challenge. We have a yard. We need a bridge that will be stable for three weeks. Well, we thought it was three weeks, but then we got a deep freeze, and then the equipment didn't work because it was so cold. And, you know, it gets so cold that even your diesel engines start gelling. So what we, we had to slow down. This thing was in service probably for a good, oh, three months until we were able to get this done. So this abutment, this, I'm sorry, this was the pier. This is the fixed pier. It's always a good idea to keep your fixity to replicate the field whenever possible because that's where you know you know, where your fixed point is and where your expansion is going to go. So we tried to mimic the bearing alignment plan. And I cannot tell you how frustrated our yard was with me, but to their credit, they were willing to excavate our beautifully compacted fill two feet and put a crushed stone base and then drop our, um, drop our crane mats too deep so I could get, remember, passive resistance. All you, how many of you are designers, by the way? It's so much easier to design in a greenfield. Trying to mimic passive pressure on my fixed, uh, and then if we got it all built and we're getting ready to put the crushed stone in, and then we got this really big rain, and then it froze, and we had a lake. I called it Lake Lancaster around our, but it did lock it. Ice is really can be your friend when it's locked in, but of course, what happens when it melts? Freeze thaw. So you'll see that a little bit later. So then we start building the bridge. We've got the horizontal and vertical control laid out. We start at one end of the bridge. This is a short side span, so go 130 feet away. Here's a really deep haunch girder. And then the curvature starts. And then the iron workers are telling me, Bob, we think you laid out Pier 2 in the wrong location. Because it does look like the bridge is going that way and the pier is here. Uh, let me see if I can continue. Uh, but we actually did hit the second pier, which is the fixed pier. And then we landed at the other abutment. Um, a little bit funny this here. Um, it was very difficult to read the worksheets, very complex skew geometry, and they actually used a different work point, so we had to realign the bridge. So if I were to zoom really close, you'll see two sets of work point. And I had to cross out the first landing point of the girders and say, no, land over here, because we had to realign the structure on the fly. Um, it was really, it was enjoyable. But anyway, if you look at this geometry, 
You can see the no-load profile of a haunch girder. Doesn't that look very Dr. Seuss-ish? I see a few heads nodding. It's just a little different than the usual ge geometry. But it was fun because it kept you awake at night. All right. Here's a lateral bracing. Uh, Dr. Elwig was lecturing this morning on lateral uh, stability and he was talking about lateral bracing versus torsional bracing and here's some of your lateral relative bracing points. Here's some of our, um, this is our Drexel University student and one of my coworkers, Eric, freezing in prob, they were serving in probably 12, 13 degree weather. It was really not fun, it was windy. And this is a typical survey setup. It is 522, eight minutes. Um, and this is pretty much what it looks like when it was completed in our yard. This is the part we would have assembled regardless. You have curved elements on a very tight radius. These are plate diaphragms with full depth um, mill to bear connections. This assembly right here would have been assembled regardless. We would have done that in our yard, but we wouldn't have assembled the rest of the structure if we didn't have to by contract. Now, what's interesting, I'm glad we did because this, bear, this girder is bearing stiffener because of the skew of the bridge. It, the incline of the bearing stiffener is towards you, the end kick, because it has to be truly vertical after all deflections have taken place. Its neighbors all tilt away from you. Well, our fabricators were actually building these guys first and they got to this one last and said, that's a detail error. So they took it upon themselves to weld, full pen by the way, full pen weld the stiffener in what they thought was the right position. So we're glad we caught that because when we assembled it, we would have had to do that twice. And it's a lot less costly to fix that at your shop than in the field. So, but this again is the part we would have assembled. We would not have assembled the rest of the structure if we weren't paid to do it by contract. This is just some nice pictures of the remaining structure. Now, this is the erection sequence. This is where it gets interesting. And you can read about this in the paper. This is how we erected it in the yard on false work. Basically, short construction is the concrete equivalent, right? So we could go from point A to point B in sequence, no worries. In the field, it's not so easy. The throughway and canal authority doesn't usually let you put a tower in the canal. I've built about five bridges there. This is the first time they allowed us to get in the canal. A couple of them had, you know, reasons for it um, that we were other, like environmental reasons for not going into the canal. But this was a case where they said, nope, you have to have a tower. But they erected the two side spans first and then set the main span. Just as my predecessor in the presentation said that the, you could tell by the erection sequence that they had locked on in the stresses and that's why that, that one trust member shifted. Same thing, are, are they going to be able to get the same cameras reproduced? That's the purpose of this paper and it was really interesting. This is what it looks like in a field getting erected on the first side, this is the south side. These are pictures of the other side, the north side, getting erected. So at this point, you're looking at the bridge, and here you're standing, I'm at the first pier, looking at the other side, wondering if that steel is actually going to connect. I know it does, and the, the erector's survey are also new to put that false work in the right place, but we all agreed it just was a little bit counterintuitive just because the curves and the haunches and the vertical curvature was so sharp. This is a beautiful picture on a nice crisp uh, April morning when they set the drop in and this is when they got two lines up and everybody breathed a sigh of relief because it fit like a glove. I really want to get to the technical results so here we go. If you look and linger on this chart, I have five minutes so you'll have to linger quickly. But anything that's highlighted in red is where we were low. This is the yard assembly, this is the field assembly. This is begin abutment, this is pier one, pier two, end abutment. Here's the maximum moment, dead load moment areas, right? 0.4 L1, mid span of span two, and 0.6 L3. We all agree that's generally a, a, generally a dead load profile for a continuous structure, and in, indeed it was. This is where we were low. This is where we were low on the outside of the curve, outside of the curve, and outside, because it goes through a reverse curve. In the field, it had the same exact same low points, exact same high points, but it was a little bit more magnified. What was an inch and a half, it was a half inch low at no load profile at the main span, which is span two over here. After spring thaw, both of my piers dropped a half inch, so that brought us to an inch low. When we loaded the thing under steel dead load, very carefully now, um, we were an inch and a half low, and in the field, it was two inches low. 
So the difference between inch and a half low and two inches low, but the bridge had a pronounced vertical curve profile. We were communicating with the thruway authority the whole time, and their designers said, nope, we've got enough um, vertical clearance. We're fine. It's not an issue um, because they have a lot of boat traffic. Very important boat traffic takes the canal. So. And this is just some nice pictures of construction after, that, after we left. They decked the structure. Here's some aerial photography from D.A. Collins, our contractor. Anybody use a drone yet? It's really cool. Oh, drones are fun. You can fly around and take the most amazing pictures. Here's a picture of the decking, and you can see that there are beautiful parks that are going to be on the north side, the south side. Here's some archaeological sites. And this is going to be a park that connects this part of the city to the other part. It basically contributes to the community as well as just being a bridge. It's beautiful. There's nothing wrong with having a lovely bridge that families can walk through. There are going to be trees here, and yet to the astute eye, you can see you can still drive a fire truck across the bridge, even though people aren't supposed to be driving their cars across. That's pretty much what I want to show you. Once in a while, a bridge comes along that just, it doesn't just connect point A to point B. It's not just infrastructure. True, this is an expensive bridge. The customer really wanted to make sure that it would behave the way they thought it would behave because even designing it's a little different than your usual highway bridge. And yet it all fit. A lot of people worked together to get this to work and it, it just came out nicely. Um, that's just the final pictures. I think I'm done. Oh, you need your PDH code. Four, you've all paid attention and I think most of you are awake so you're allowed to write down 41777. I think that's it. Let's, uh, let's thank Bob again. Okay, we're right on schedule. Our, our last presentation tonight is going to be by Andrew Keyshaw. He's with Alfred Benish and Company in Chicago, Illinois. He's the structures group leader there. Um, Andrew's worked on several high-profile projects, including the Wacker Drive reconstruction in downtown Chicago and a new major bridge that will carry I-74 over the Mississippi River. Andrew also has a leading role in the construction engineering practice at Benish where he assists contractors in addressing some of their most pressing con uh, project challenges. And he's here today to talk about some case studies of complex girder erection. So without further ado, there you are. Come on up. All right, thank you. All right, we're close to dinner, but there are, there are pretty pictures, so hopefully it'll uh, stay entertaining. Um, PDH code's there. They, they make us say that, obviously. Um, uh, as mentioned, I work for uh, Alfred Benishing Company out of Chicago. Um, we have a little niche practice there where we actually work for contractors and uh, assist those in the erection engineering side of it. The four case studies that I'll touch on here are actually in four different locations, uh, three different owners, three different designers, four different contractors, four different methods, but yet they're all relatively similar bridges. So it really does kind of illustrate that there's any number of different challenges and they're all unique. You know, James mentioned it earlier and, and obviously Bob hit on a ton of different unique uh, challenges there. But there, there are common themes though. Uh, obviously, when, whenever you're doing erection engineering, structural stability is, is trumps all other themes. Uh, it's just kind of a, a very obvious uh, uh, statement for the people in this room. So, structures are certainly their most vulnerable in the partially erected state. Uh, this was a, a bridge in Tennessee uh, over 20 years ago. The critical thing in this picture is they removed that cross from there having trouble with fit up, increase the unbraced length. There are always a number of factors that, that go into any failure but uh, but you know that, that obviously is something that could have been avoided. When curvature is introduced into the equation obviously you get even more challenges that you have to address. Uh, second order effects, detailing, you know, does your model represent what's in the field, timing, support points, uh, and all that uh, other stuff as well. The other common theme that uh, we actually end up spending more time on, uh, on the design side, if we get a good contractor who's really trying to manage their resources, is, is operational efficiency. Uh, every project has different constraints, every contractor has different resources, every contractor has different preferred methods of erection or the means and methods or their expertise, uh, and, and I'm 
uh, was telling James earlier, I think we're up to maybe a dozen or more of these bridges and they're still coming up with new things that I'd, I've never heard of before. Um, and then understanding where their investment is. Uh, obviously cranes are the easy one, access trucks, but uh, the, the number one is, is really time. Uh, something we've actually done quite a bit is uh, working with contractors to develop uh, more efficient splice plans. Uh, if they've got a crew up top and a crew down below uh, and just two cranes or a two crane pick, they really don't like wasting ha uh, half their iron worker time. So we try to get them off that girder as quick as possible, uh, basically do kind of a, a thorough assessment there. Uh, we use Lucis software for, for our analysis. I, I like that it allows you to run several different closed form analyses within one form so you can really present nice solutions. Um, for these 4K studies, uh, obviously there are always a number of challenges. I'll try to focus on, uh, I guess, the, uh, the more high profile or the, the sexier components of them. Uh, this first one is I-270 over the Chain Rocks Canal in, in St. Louis. Uh, the big body of water there on the left on that blow up is actually the Mississippi River. It's very meandery in this area. Uh, so the barge and the navigation traffic actually uses the canal, which is, uh, it seems small in, in this structure, but uh, the main span, navigation span, was 490 feet. Uh, very deep uh, plate girders for the, for the main span, obviously. Here you can see just a, an aerial of the barge traffic. Uh, the plate girder structure was replacing uh, a three-span continuous truss, so it's, uh, you know, steel is obviously, uh, and what they can do with regard to plate girders and fabrication and transport, it's, it's really coming a ways. Um, the, the main constraint here, strand jacking. Uh, Got to make sure we take care of that uh, center span. Limited closure windows for the Coast Guard, uh, obviously Mississippi River, uh, so substantial amounts of, of barge traffic. Uh, to get to the main span, because uh, there were uh, actually 450 foot side spans on either side, uh, they use shoring towers, relatively a, a simple or more straightforward uh, type of construction. However, the detailing of the shoring towers was actually very unique uh, because uh, the shoring tower that you can see here, when that was released, we were looking at almost 20 inches of deflection. So we obviously really didn't want to get that tower stuck um, prior to release. Now the fun part, strand jacking. Uh, the designer, uh, HDR, uh, their schematic erection sequence included with the plans uh, did involve strand jacking the three segments pre-constructed on a barge uh, and working with Walsh Construction. That was what they selected. Uh, the middle span segments were 370 foot when they were, all three were spliced together. Uh, here's the, the strand jacking detail that we kind of came up with. Uh, in working with our, our younger designers, uh, I say they all look the same. You know, we've, we actually use something similar for this as a strong back design on a four foot girder. Uh, when it's printed on 11 by 17 paper, they, they look identical. So you always have to say, you know, read that right there, which you probably can't read out there, but uh, those are twin W36 by 330s and we had two sets of these. So obviously uh, bringing a, a, a pretty good bit of, of robustness to the, uh, to the strand jacking. Um, it's, uh, I guess it's a joke, but it's always nice when the, the pictures of what they actually build look like what you designed. Uh, as you can see here, uh, the strand jacks in and of themselves, you can see, are, are, are very substantial. In the background there, you can see the staged area uh, of the, uh, I guess it's a four girder cross section. There were 10 total girders in the section. They lifted uh, two sets of four and one set of two. Uh, getting into that uh, center uh, set of two, uh, we, we started looking at the two-girder buckling uh, paper that uh, there was a paper out of the University of Texas. Um, I believe Helwig was involved in that one as well, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, but, you know, the two-girder system, when you don't have lateral bracing, there was not lateral bracing on this two-girder system, uh, you had to worry about the two-girders. Uh, we kept calling it local global buckling uh, because it was, kind of local, it was kind of global, but it was a, a local shape because uh, basically there's not a lot of resistance there stopping the two-girders from having the same buckled shape. Um, with the type of pick we were looking at, uh, having to come 60 feet up off a barge, we obviously were not uh, very comfortable with the factor of safety of 1.21. Bob touched on it. Uh, there are fabrication tolerances, sweep tolerances, erection, all that stuff. Uh, and in the model, uh, they're all pretty straight lines. Uh, so obviously that's something we weren't overly comfortable with. But the fix is relatively simple. Uh, it's out there. Um, introduced uh, some top lateral bracing, some temporary members relatively straightforward and simple to put together uh, and you can see the buckled shape change there and the factory safety goes up quite dramatically just with a, a relatively nominal reduction in, in the uh, length that was available to buckle. Here you can see uh, just an image of the strand jacking prior to lifting the last four girder segment. It's a little hard to tell in the picture but you can see the twin uh, strong back gantries up there. Here you can see the girder segments uh, going up. Um, 
One of the things we learned uh, on this project, I think it's always nice at these conferences to share lessons learned, is, is how important communication is. Um, obviously, even at, at this conference, everyone is, is relatively in the same arena, but the level of expertise, especially at, at the very high end, it, it gets separated pretty quickly. Uh, I enjoyed Bob's talk. I don't know much about the fabrication side. I know enough to be functional, but I, I won't ever claim to be very high end. It's not fair as a design engineer to assume that your erector you know, understands all the serviceability requirements, all of this stuff. Now, the, the one thing we did think to tell them was that on a large scale that, you know, they may think it's not working when they start lifting because you're going to look at, you have the deflection of the, the system up above, the deflection of the local strong backs, the elongation of the rod, and then the barge coming out of water. So they were going to go through a couple cycles before they would see these girders come off the barge. And we thought enough to tell them that, but we just, we were kind of generic about it. Uh, and they, you know, had some deflection concerns going on and we could have certainly given them, you know, much more data. Uh, but again, it's a matter of, you know, not fully understanding what was going to be critical to them at that time. Next case study, we're bouncing down into central Tennessee. Um, this uh, bridge, 1,500 foot long, uh, several 335 foot spans, uh, piers incredibly tall in this area. It's kind of a Tennessee river gorge type area. Uh, this picture is uh, to scale. Deep water was the, the primary challenge. Uh, short, contractor deemed shoring towers not practical. Uh, from this uh, to scale elevation, you can kind of see that's true. Our marketing people always like to try to come up with some way to give it a little more scale. Um, so I think they did that one there. Uh, so what they chose, pier brackets. Um, and of course, not only with, uh, did they want to use pier brackets and start up here too, you know, we can handle that before, but with the weight of the negative moment segments and the cranes they had available, uh, they of course wanted to lift them, you know, one at a time. Uh, so here is the model of our, our pier bracket. Uh, the key in any of these stability critical models is the model can be great, but if it's not how it behaves in the field, then really, really bad things can happen. Uh, because of that and with the symmetry, we modeled this entire structure as a one-way system and did all of our assessments one way and every time we saw a tension in a reaction, we would take away the support. Um, now, uh, a lot of our team prides ourselves on being able to debug models pretty quickly, but when you're continually changing the variables and removing supports, it actually took a while to get this one dialed in uh, for the variety of limit states we wanted to, to assess. Um, some of those uh, limit states, uh, the simple ones, you know, wind load, uh, but then also, you know, construction loads and, and all the, the variety of loads that are there. The pier segments were symmetric, so in theory, you know, before you start hitting it with these, you know, various forces, it's nice and stable and you don't see much. Um, we came up with, in working with the contractor, what were they going to attach to this thing? What were they going to use for work points? You know, what were, you know, if a crane's bringing a new girder or the, the drop-in segments in and it, and it impacts the girder. What are we looking at for some of those stability type loads? Uh, quartering wind loads actually ended up being one of the things that controlled and you'll, you'll kind of see how that looks later. Um, this picture again is to scale. You can see these pier brackets are relatively modest given the size and scale of girders that they're, they're supporting. You'll see that again. Uh, here you can see actually the first pier segment going in uh, at pier two. Uh, to give it a little scale, you can see the people standing there. Um, what we used for quartering winds were, were the, these twin uh, HSS pipes. Uh, obviously, we needed two points of support to resist any of the rotation. Uh, there were obviously substantial wind restrictions uh, when getting these first two girders up, uh, but when you're dealing with eight and a half or, or 10 foot tall girders or whatever these were, I don't recall offhand, uh, that are 100 feet long, obviously uh, that, that can draw some pretty big area uh, and even relatively modest wind loads uh, can actually cause a little bit of or more rotation than we'd all be comfortable with. Uh, after starting with uh, Pier 2 and uh, getting Pier 2 and Pier 3 done, the drop-in segments. Um, the, and, and by this point, we kind of figured out communication uh, with the contractors a little better. Uh, and we uh, raised it to their attention that we had this step here. Listen, we put unbolt the cross frames. Because we knew, understanding their operations, that, that they weren't going to want to do this step. You know, they have their man buckets everywhere. They have their crews. It's a big operation. And they need to move over here and unbolt these cross frames. Um, but we found it easy, we just show them a picture. Um, we said, you know, they'd be able to get their drop-in segment in, um, but girders one and two on the top, they're gonna go for a ride in that positive moment behavior when you drop in three, four, uh, and then it, it usually gets their attention to say, and then girders one and two drop-in segment would not be feasible. That usually gets a pretty good uh, reaction. So, so what do we unbolt again? So, uh, so anyway, we uh, were able to use uh, Lewis's, the graphical interface to, to, to illustrate those. 
Uh, so getting span two done, uh, span three, the first one went in uh, relatively simple uh, in that the structure was still behaving pretty normally. Um, certainly the pier four side was relatively flat. The pier three side, the girders were pointed upward. We did tell them that in using their two cranes, um, they'd have to make these splices first with that crane holding it very high and then they'd have to come down. Um, we did have a conference call with them. We illustrated that. The operator in the field, um, obviously very much so in the interest of safety, was very hesitant to lower that crane. Um, I got a call at 10 p.m. They're like, hey, we want to revisit this. You know, we're okay to lower. Because they had these splices made or they were, the cranes were essentially fighting each other. Uh, and, and it was actually stopping the erection from, from being made. Um, and uh, so we decided, again, we need more pictures for when you come into this uh, last girder one, two drop-in segments. Uh, Tennessee is very efficient with their steel. They don't have uh, large amounts of traffic, so the bridges are relatively narrow, very efficient steel designs, difficult to transport. So you can see here, on these girders, we're looking at 9.1 and 6.5 and inches of upward deflection there. Uh, so again, if, if, if this last drop in segment was tough, this one's going to be even more tough. Uh, we ended up putting together a very detailed procedure. Essentially, you got to make a little bit of the connection there, reduce a little load in the crane, make that connection, tell this crane to go away, and then use the one crane to lower them in over there. So we were very, very detailed with them with regard to literally, you know, get a number of bolts in. It's okay to lower the load. Again, it is a sign of respect to the operators that they want to see that stamp. They want to know it's not someone making the call in the field, you know, that leads to, you know, that could potentially jeopardize uh, the safety of, of all the iron workers that are up there. Here you can see one of the drop-in segments going in at this point. This crane has been released and they're working on these splices over here. You can see the little work bridges they put on the bridge. Next case study we'll touch on, uh, up, in, uh, up near Chicago, a uh, brand new expressway to serve the western side of O'Hare. This was a flyover ramp, about 2,100 feet long, 250 foot spans. Um, I'll go through this one a little quick because a lot of us are familiar with curvature. Um, it's just a matter of how you handle it. Uh, obviously it has to be handled during erection uh, or, or during the pick and during erection. Um, uh, UT Lift has a phenomenal product out there, a lot of good stuff coming out of Texas. For those of you who haven't used that, I would highly recommend it. Uh, it is available for free download. Again, it's not going to give you the answer, but it will give you a lot of data that will help you develop the answer. Um, in terms of accommodating roll during the pick, um, we developed terminology with the contractor that we always wanted to have good roll. Good roll was always having a spreader beam that's just a little too short. And if uh, the analogy I always use when uh, actually in, in teaching this in a class is if you tie a string around the middle of a banana and pick it up, those ends are going to roll down. Um, and if you can think of the 3D version of that, you know, that's kind of illustrated right here. Because the thing is, if we had the quote unquote good roll, we could use the adjustment detail. Uh, they said they'd use this before for a bunch of the typical workhorse bridges, you know, the 120 foot spans, four foot deep, uh, and they wanted to use this again. And uh, the first question is simply, you know, um, all right, I get the, the physics of it, but, but does it work from an engineering perspective uh, at a much larger scale? Uh, which anytime you go complex or push the limits, you know, you're, you're wanting to, to look at that. So basically what we did is relatively simple mechanics. I mean, we needed to develop the restoring moment to replumb that girder. Coming back to the detail, you can see essentially, oop, you know, if we can pull on the bottom, push on the top, kind of replumbs it back up. They did a lot of trial picks on the ground to make sure they felt very comfortable that it was nice and plumb prior to sending the girder up uh, because if it's not plumb when they reach their splice, they're going to have a very hard time pushing and fitting and getting that uh, locked into place. Here you can see uh, an image, uh, the spreader beam. Uh, one modification we did make is they ended up going with two kickers at the top because it was just so hard to align all those pieces. Uh, and obviously with just those single angles, if you get any lateral force at the end of that, it, you're going to lose your stiffness pretty quick. During construction, uh, again, a lot of eigenvalue buckling. Um, we also used uh, with curvature, uh, I'd always recommend using geometrically nonlinear. Make sure you want to make sure you capture second order effects. Um, this is, uh, I wanted to touch on erection fit-up challenges a little bit because we talk about dealing with contractor constraints. Uh, and for this particular stage, they said we have to start in the middle. Um, let them know that, you know, going inside out is, is generally a very tough way to erect a curved girder structure. Um, and we kind of let them know with differential deflection. I didn't put it together to the degree that you'll see it here, but, but they knew that they would have a challenge. They had done inside out curved girder before, so they said they were going to do it. Uh, based on the constraints. They knew it wasn't ideal. 
they, they thought they knew what they were getting into. Um, you can see the differential deflection, these are in feet, uh, one and a quarter on the first girder, two inches on the second girder. So, you know, relatively modest, nothing we can't really, you know, address. Uh, here's an image of, you know, in the no load condition, you know, they're, they're fine and, and great. But when they deflect and you get the differential deflection and the rotation, because they go hang these cross frames out here before bringing in that next girder, you can really end up with a pretty significant fit up challenge at when that girder five comes in. Now, we told them that it's not a safety issue. It's just, you, you know, you're going to have to, uh, you know, the old fashioned method that James showed, you know, there was a, a sledgehammer and a whole lot of drift pins and a whole lot more sledgehammer. Um, so anyway, uh, and then obviously once that girder's in, the challenge becomes even more difficult. And they called us, they said, okay, that was, you know, harder than we had anticipated. You know, what can we do? How can we look to address this? Um, we came up with something that obviously differential deflection doesn't exist at your supports. So again, the operator can be your best friend. So he said, all right, well, get the girder in place. It's, it don't even look at those middle cross frames right off the bat, but go to the abutment and make your cross frame connection there. No differential deflection. Then come back, have a second crew over here because they had two crews out there anyway. So stitch those two together and then take a little bit of load off the crane, you know, lines up the next one, take a little more load off the crane, lines up the next one, take a little more load off. So we were basically using the crane to gradually you know, we refer to it as stitch these cross frames together to finally make it. Uh, now the beauty of it is the crane had full capacity, so we weren't didn't have to worry about a stability issue. Uh, we did look at stability if the crane released load with three or four um, cross frames not done in the middle, and it wasn't really a concern. We were uh, on the phone with them when they did this, and they said this was uh, much better than even getting girder five in. So again, it's that communication because uh, there is a way if you understand, you know, their challenges uh, and. Uh, and their expertise. Uh, in one of the other units, they said, um, all right, we're, we're done with that. We're just going to, I'd rather put a whole new shoring tower in. Um, uh, the, again, on the communication side, the shoring, this was a rel relatively wide ramp with a heavy super, and now they're also wanting to go outside in. So again, we were very clear that this is going to look very goofy when you put up uh, that outer girder up, but don't worry, we've looked at it. You can see there are some special details at the base there. Uh, I like to say iron workers don't always trust engineers and they decided that they would add a brace for that. Uh, here you can see the shoring tower in play. Uh, last case study, uh, this is in eastern part of Tennessee, uh, own, owned and designed by Tennessee DOT, K and K construction. Very, very, very similar to the previous Tennessee bridge. Uh, low population area, very deep water, four girder cross section, very long. Um, but this particular contractor, when they first approached us, I said, hey, no big deal, we've done this one before. We just dust off the plans for that other one that was, you know, over the water. Um, they did not want to use pier brackets. Uh, never really got into it, but they, they, they weren't comfortable and, and that's okay. It's their means and methods. Uh, the first thing they came up with was to use three cranes and kind of leapfrog them around and use one crane as a hold crane and all, we told them all this would have to be done in a continuous work period. We had substantial production concerns. These girders, again, eight and a half or nine feet tall, uh, hundreds and hundreds of bolts in each of the splices. Uh, in the partial state, we weren't really able to reduce the number of bolts required as much as they would need to to get it erected. But they said they're going to get started, assess their production rates, and then come back and revisit this. Well, um, yeah, they said that's not going to happen. So, uh, but the contractor essentially said, if you're allowing me to use a crane, to hold this girder in place while I do leapfrog, why can't I put a shoring tower on a barge? Um, and that uh, was not what, uh, anything we really considered ideal, um, but we told them we'd look into it. Um, obviously, a lot of times structures are built on barges and floated in, but usually you're talking about one or two loading scenarios. Uh, this would be four girders coming in, four girders going out, unbalanced loading, and it had several more challenges than, than the, you know, the more conventional floated in, you know, ballast tanks and all that fun stuff. So we first looked to see if it was even feasible. Um, so we kind of drew it up. We wanted to understand it. You know, here's where the cranes would be. And then, okay, we can go to our model and see what would the load on the tower be in that scenario. You know, uh, get to the pier. We did want them to get to the pier first, you know, to generate that inherent extra stability. Take advantage of the pier that we have. What's the load there? Come on uh, to the outer girders next. See so what, you know, get to the pier. So again, we're looking everything in conjunction with is it feasible to, to build with the cranes they have, with capacities, and then what is the, what is the load? So we ended up with the, the total of 400,000 uh, pounds. The barge configuration they wanted to have is, is illustrated here. So basically we figured out that 
okay, I suppose it's feasible. There, there, there's a, a fighting chance to get this to work. Uh, but obviously the list was, was still our, our big concern. Uh, stage four load was where, or stage four of this substage, I suppose, uh, was where we really had the controlling list. Each of those two girders are at about 100 kips with 94 kips uh, on the girder on the left there. Um, so we got our load, we got our area. Uh, it really gets into, again, coming back to mechanics. There's not a lot of codes that govern uh, you know, partially completed structures. I mean, if you want, uh, Astro's got 277 pages on a completed, uh, on the steel section on a completed structure and tells you everything you want, but they just really leave the, uh, the erection stuff and the partially completed stuff uh, in, in the, um, I always say it's the, you better know what you're doing category. Um, but, you know, for, let's get the baseline numbers. You know, the P over A, what's the average pressure we need? Um, you know, uh, and then we could, we found out we had, you know, a listing moment. Uh, we kind of were treating it a little bit like a footing. Uh, we did a, a good bit of research on naval engineering and found out that that, that is essentially how you do it. I mean, it, it does make sense. Um, but the, the first question, 1,760 kip feet, is that a lot? Um, we determined section modulus of a barge. Uh, for all the designers in the room, everyone that raised their hands earlier, I challenge anyone if they've ever used 32,000 feet cubed in any of your equations before. Um, Anyway, so uh, run the statics on it. Uh, we need 55 PSF in the triangular load distribution. So that's 10 and a half inches of draft at the far end, and our baseline was two feet. So, you know, we've got a range that, again, in theory, this works. Um, you know, it meets the, the naval engineering requirements. Uh, however, again, this is to scale. We were not comfortable with the amount of lists that we would have had here. Um, so we start looking into ballast tanks and I start to, I broach that topic to the contractor and after all this he says, oh, we've got ballast barges, so oh, thanks, um, awesome, let's send them to Tennessee. Um, the total ballast they had available in the section was 300,000 pounds. As soon as we heard that, six barges at 50,000 pounds, I was like, all right, what the hell, we're going to put a shoring tower on a barge. You know, you kind of knew at that point you were going to be able to do this. Um, uh, don't tell the risk department. Um, you know. It wasn't quite equal to the total load, but, uh, you know, but we knew we were going to be close enough to make up the difference. Um, and kind of like I mentioned on the Walsh project, uh, I-270 over Chain of Rocks, uh, we were very used to detailing bolsters and stage jacking to basically be able to accommodate deflection and, and some of those other differences uh, that we would need to do to accommodate the 90,000 pound difference in the barge ballast. So uh, what are the steps? Again, you need to be very, very clear to the contractor. First thing you need to do, you know, build your shoring tower and your barge and fill everything up, full load when you get it out there. Get it into position. Um, obviously, we, had, uh, we did have anchor lines uh, on there. Uh, they, they'd used anchors for stability before. We were relatively comfortable with it. Uh, when we were doing the picks and the ballast, there was a tug on site as well, uh, just in, uh, for added stability. Um, here's where the uh, communication gets key. Uh, these barges, you know, have five foot of draft, 300,000 pounds of water. We can't tell the crane operator, you're not setting these girders on the tower. You know, the tower will take half the girder from you. So we said pump out 100,000 pounds, monitor gauges, all that stuff. When you get that roughly 100,000 pounds out or when your crane load roughly cuts in half, then you can release. So the crane operator did that. Um, then they get to this stage. Now this was the more critical one, but again, the same uh, same methodology for the contractor, pump out the water. You will not set this girder on the shoring tower. The shoring tower will take the girder from you. So, and that's what they did. And they were able to pump out water while they're making cross frames. It was actually fairly, you know, efficient because obviously we're, we're moving quite a bit of water around. Bring in the last girder, kind of the same operation, pump that dry. Um, then now we've got the, the, the kid with the beach ball effect where, you know, we got a really big bridge holding a shoring tower underwater, fill it back up, adjust the bolsters to, to facilitate the release. Uh, Tennessee DOT, um, I, I had a little bit of concern on that one. Um, so, uh, so they wanted a little more you know, quality control on there. Uh, the contractor was already well on board with the, the heavy amounts of surveying required to, maintain, uh, to ensure this barge stayed level. Um, and we were certainly conservative in that criteria. Uh, obviously, we didn't like 2.2% list, but if we had 0.3% at the end of the day, that's something we could live with, but we weren't even giving them that, so I think we gave them 0.1, which over that length is actually well within the tolerances that, that were discussed before. Uh, but TDOT also wants to look at what if the barge sinks and what if we get a flash flood. Uh, we did already have weather, uh, you know, monitoring weather in their forecast, uh, but sinking barge, very simple, remove the supports. Um, structure stayed elastic. Um, we said it would be recoverable. We, 
felt okay with it. Tennessee bought it and they were okay with it. Uh, and then the sinking barge was the, the simple, you know, 750,000 pounds upward, full, full force effect. The key here was the pier stayed engaged. We didn't want to lose the pier because uh, obviously a flash flood effect, you're also looking at heavy stream flows. So if you lose the pier and you got this, uh, bad. Uh, we were able to, we held the pier, which was, was good. Uh, did not buckle in compression in the adjacent span. Uh, so we were happy about that. Um, here you can see again the scale. There's a person down there. I mean, these towers were just enormous, which now you can see why we were not at all comfortable with a 2.2% list. Uh, and again, this is in eastern Tennessee. Uh, this is one of the first ones they sent us the picture. I was obviously very happy. Uh, being a Midwesterner, it's kind of like the NFL films effect. The snow kind of gives it a little drama. So um, very, very happy about that. Uh, and you can see there, uh, really did maintain, did a great job maintaining level. It's hard to see here, but they've got, when I first got this picture, you zoom in really tight, you can see where all the pumps are that they're doing stuff, the survey monitor points and all that. So uh, got, really just got to give a lot of credit to the contractor on that one for, for getting it done. Uh, the obligatory PDH code, uh, and thank you again for your time. And uh, I know we're right on time, but I'd be glad to answer any questions. <laughs> Uh, on the first one, they could have. They had them there just in case in the shallow water. Uh, they did three spans like this. Once it got deep, spuds were going to be out. So we did have the benefit, full disclosure, of training wheels, a, a training wheels version of this, um, which worked. Um, I wouldn't be presenting it if the one without training wheels didn't work. So. We did. What's not shown here, and, and from a design perspective, I'm, I'm not sure why they did it. Tennessee DOT is a good client of our Nashville office, so I won't speak ill of them. But there were minor curves at the end of each of these bridges, um, which really kind of created a challenge. And the overall length of the continuous unit was 2,100 feet. Um, I feel like there probably would have been a launching alternate there. That, that probably would have been the next place we would have went. Um, but. Uh, the contractor really liked the simple methods. I mean, they didn't want the peer brackets. We've worked with them before. Um, yeah, it, it kind of gets into to their approach. Thank you. All right. Well, let's uh, give them a round of applause.